So good afternoon once again, and many thanks for joining us from the different parts of the world. Um, I can see some people from the US, from Zimbabwe, South Africa, from um, Europe as well. Um, so we just want to welcome you to this one of uh, the seminars in our series, seminar series um, as the Zimbabwe uh, Society of Conservation Biology uh, chapter. Today we are really privileged to have um, speaking to us uh, Raul um, Dutoy. Raul is is a very uh, um, distinguished uh, practitioner in Zimbabwe and uh, world renowned around rhino conservation. And I'll talk uh, do a quick introduction in a few minutes. Um, uh, before he he speaks, but just to welcome everybody, just a reminder: please do mute yourself, um, use the chat as well. Um, particularly when Raúl is giving his talk, questions um, we would really really appreciate those, and then we can field those to to him once uh, um, his talk is finished. Um, our society uh, chapter is uh, led by a team um, that's led by myself. My name is Mkolisi, Mkolisi Spanda, everybody calls me MX. And uh, these are the wonderful faces um, and people uh, that are part of the team. Nobesutu is uh, president-elect, Diane, our treasurer, Rebecca is our secretary, um, team is our vice president and uh, Melin is our project officer. And all that we're doing, um, everyone is providing their time, their uh, expertise um, freely and just want to acknowledge them. I'm putting them up here so that you can also be able to get in touch, know who to get in touch with um, going forward um, if you need to. Um, we really uh, finalized uh, finalizing our strategy. We just need to write it up, but uh, we so acknowledge the input that we got from everyone who did put in the survey what they would like to see the chapter doing. Uh, we invite many of you to be friends or members. Uh, you don't need to be a member of the Society for Conservation Biology to be a friend or a member of our chapter, please do sign up on our website. Um, that is the address is there, www.zimscb.org uh, slash uh, forward slash sign up. It will take you to that page. If you can, please, we do encourage you to be a member of Conservation Biology uh, Society, Society for Conservation Biology, which is a global, um, society that brings together practitioners, um, um, uh, government, academics, um, and all sorts of people interested in conservation uh, around the world. So it's a global society, um, runs a few publications, uh, chief among those being the Conservation Biology um, uh, Journal. Uh, so please do, do, do join. There are benefits to being members of that and uh, if you are, you're allowed to vote in the elections, including for our chapter. We've got a, a few projects that we are running as a team. Uh, the first one is a resource library. We're wanting to bring all the information um, in scientific literature, great literature um, uh, on conservation in Zimbabwe and would really encourage you to, to please um, uh, share that with us. Uh, Diane is leading uh, that uh, element of our uh, straight of our of, of our work. Uh, Nobesutu is doing um, leading our horizon scan and our blog and seminar uh, series. Our blog is led by a team. I lead the seminar series, and uh, all these projects we're bringing together for the benefit of all of us. So please do. Um, not those things. We do run a, a YouTube channel where we put all our seminars. So please do go there 
and have a look at the resources, the seminars that we've had in the past um, as well. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you're on Facebook, please do get on Facebook and look for, for us there as well. Um, just want to shout out, if you've got a blog, please do, do get in touch with the team on that. We already have a, quite a number of blogs and would like to have more blogs with different ideas and stories. We're trying to also keep it not just insular to Zimbabwe. So if you think you have a story that's relevant to other um, places, but um, would like to share it, please do get in touch as well. So once again, do sign up. Um, um, we will keep posting as well our upcoming seminars, which will cover a variety of issues for us. Uh, we're hoping to continue to uh, cover the conservation agriculture interface, which is quite popular, fresh water. We've lined up exciting seminars. And uh, if you have people that you'd like to see come and give talks, please do uh, let us know as well. And we will uh, be uh, keen to have those. So um, as I said, it's, it's a real pleasure this uh, afternoon to to, to have uh, Raul speaking with us, uh, uh, to us. And uh, I just wanted to just mention a few things uh, about him. So for many of you who know Raul, he's, he's uh, Zimbabwean and uh, has a long standing career as, um, as a rhino conservationist. Um, he began his career um, doing impact assessment work, uh, coordinating the first major EIA for the proposed uh, hydro schemes on the Zambezi River. And then soon after that, he uh, joined the IUCN elephant and rhino specialist groups uh, as a scientific officer. And then he worked for many, many years uh, at WWF on several rhino projects in Africa, including including the project funded by the Bay, uh, Bay Trust to establish large rhino conservancies in Southern Zimbabwe. And this um, has been on the news lately. It's one of our success stories as Zimbabwe, but also very challenged uh, uh, in many ways. Um, but I think uh, Raul um, would be very proud to have been involved from the onset of um, establishing the large rhino conservancies in Southern Zimbabwe. Um, um, he has worked very hard to establish the regional rhino conservation program of Southern Africa, uh, particularly in Sadak. And then um, this has all culminated uh, in 2009 with him establishing the Lowveld Rhino Trust of which he is director. And this has been supported by uh, many institutions and people across the world, um, and um, including the Rhino uh, Foundation, the International Rhino Foundation, of which uh, Raul serves as an international advisor on that. My first experience with Raul was when I joined WWF many years ago. And uh, I uh, remember one particular event. He um, uh, we went to an annual planning meeting and he was taking copious notes. Uh, and uh, that's how detailed he is. And I still remember as him as one of those people that were on to the detail. And if you've been involved with rhinos, you know why that is very important. And uh, so he's one been acknowledged worldwide through several awards and of which we, we delighted uh, Raul. So this afternoon, he will speak about the challenges and opportunities in rhino conservation. And uh, I think it's fitting for him to speak about that, uh, seeing his long involvement and continuing um, support for rhino conservation in Zimbabwe, not just Zimbabwe. When I was in WWF, when we were going through sticky points in Kenya and as managing that we 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 had to call on him for his expertise and so he's um, 
very useful for Zimbabwe and beyond. So Raul, it's an incredible pleasure. Um, please uh, do share your slides and uh, your, your presentation this afternoon. And uh, for everybody, please do put your comments, your questions on chat, and we will have that at the at DNA after Raul's uh, talk. So welcome. Thanks very much. I hope you can see my presentation. It yes, is. we can see it. All right, fine. Uh, thanks, MX. So um, basically, um, I'm presenting a, a, a few snapshots regarding rhino conservation biology. Um, these snapshots come from years of accumulated data in the low field rhino trust, because even though we're a small organization, we've been at this game for quite a while almost an embarrassingly long time. Um, and we built up a lot of data, which we only now are trying to find the time to really analyze, but we're determined to do that because it's amazing how uh, these long-term projects such as ours do accumulate um, a lot of information that isn't necessarily the kind of information that get generated through specific fairly short-term research projects. Um, so I'm gonna, talk um, mainly on what I'd regard as, as some core issues to do with rhino conservation biology, given that that is what this group's all about. But I'll touch briefly on, on, on just a couple of the broader aspects surrounding rhino conservation, and, and then I think leave room in the um, question time to pick up on some of the other many threads of rhino conservation that, that I'm sure some of you may be interested in, but we can't deal with it all. I think it's true to say that rhinos are two flags of species in the sense that they are proxy indicators of general biodiversity, as are some other, other animals such as lions and other large predators. Their conservation in viable populations in, in wild areas represents a successful professional management effort over what are quite large landscapes to contain viable populations of species like black rhinos along with a full assemblage of other indigenous um, species and ecosystem services. So monitoring trends in rhinos really does serve as something of a proxy indicator for general biodiversity trends. Um, and when I initially started my career in rhino conservation, I did rather doubt the wisdom of getting involved in single species conservation. But I, I've still come to realize that rhino conservation is a very multidisciplinary field and therefore getting involved in it brings you into the coal face of many conservation issues and many different disciplines and, and, and also problems, particularly to do with land use because of the space requirements of rhinos. So um, the Low Field Rhino Trust just acknowledges it's more, it's more supported primarily by the International Rhino Foundation. And as MX said, I act as an advisor to them um, and they are very much following um, some of these conservation biology principles that I will outline now in terms of the expanded role. But just to recap quickly on rhino status, the IUC and African Rhino Specialist Groups puts together uh, data from the different range states uh, every two or three years, um, often just before CITES meeting, and there will be one later this year. Um, and this is the information that was put together up until the end of 2021, um, which, which suggests about 6,200 black rhinos and about 16,000 white rhinos currently in Africa. Um, the blacks have gone up since the last status review was done a few years ago, whereas the whites have gone down. And obviously the decline of the whites is largely because of what's been happening in South Africa, which has been getting pretty extreme. I mean, just yesterday, the senior ranger at um, Tumavati was, was, was assassinated basically um, through a hit squad. Um, so this is serious organized crime. And that, that, that is why we see that the number of white runners having gone down from over 20,000 to about 16,000 in the last few years. Um, Zimbabwe, as you can see here, is the fourth largest range state for rhinos. Um, and um, then there are lesser numbers in other countries. I would say the figures given there for Botswana are serious overestimates. Botswana suffered very debilitating poaching to an extent that is, I don't think, adequately uh, reflected in these data. Um, I would suggest the Tanzania figures are also possibly a bit inflated, but overall, this is the general picture. In Zimbabwe itself, um, we've had our ups and downs, um, but 
at the end of 2021, as you can see here, we had a combined total of just over 400 white rhinos plus just over 600 black rhinos, giving us over 1,000 rhinos for the first time in more than three decades. So despite the ups and downs and all the um, turmoil in Zimbabwe, it is currently a positive track record, um, which is pretty amazing, really. In terms of rhino poaching, you can see here that the poaching was ticking along 2001, 2002, and then built up. A lot of that was due to the problems arising with Zimbabwe's fast track resettlement program. And a lot of people don't understand that um, we suffered from um, very early phases of what really was a, uh, a combination of very negative factors in South Africa that, that built up and, and, and burnt us and then increasingly burnt South Africa as well. There were factors such as the um, involvement of South African uh, mafia, essentially, in cross-border poaching into our Rana areas in southern Zimbabwe uh, during the period in which there was very anarchic management of those areas. It was essentially a free-for-all. There was a lot of zebra poaching, uh, leading to the smuggling of zebra hides across the Limpopo to South Africa processing, and that quite inevitably led to the uh, provision of, of weaponry to those gangs to, to shoot rhinos. And uh, the conflagration in rhinos that South Africa will say started around 2007, actually started earlier, earlier here. Um, it was also linked to the pseudo hunting in South Africa, which is the was the practice that's since been stopped of um, allowing pseudo hunters, people purporting to be safari hunting, but really uh, wanting to use the export um, uh, certificates, CITES export certificates for safari hunting trophies to export horns to enter the commercial trade. Um, and there was a lot of leakage of horns from private horn stocks in South Africa. That's when the Vietnamese market started going. And uh, this, this fire got going like a bushfire. Um, and as you can see in 2007, 2008, 2009, things were really bad here. We had to move a lot of rhinos out of um, areas that were under serious poaching pressure and move them to areas that were a bit more secure. In the course of that, as I'll discuss later, we came across some very interesting insights into rhino social structure and behavior. Um, so <laughs> negative though these events were, they did provide some very important uh, lessons for us in, in, in how rhinos behave, particularly under pressure, um, under human pressure, poaching pressure. So our poaching is, um, was that high. Various interventions were started, the main one being the consolidation of rhinos into more secure areas and the poaching rates started dropping. Um, we have had problems of underinvestment, as I'll mention later, most of our rhinos are on private land areas. And these have been through the ups and downs, again, associated with Zimbabwe's politics. And um, even though most of the rhinos were in the private conservancies in the low felt, we nonetheless had a situation that they had the weakness that um, uh, where there were situations of corrupt staff, uh, lacking adequate pay and uh, relatively poor conditions of service as a consequence of the decline in the private wildlife industry, that created the conditions for those staff to become colluders in the poaching. And that's, for instance, why we had so much poaching in 2008, 2019. But with new impact investment and um, major effort to turn this around, um, you can see the poaching has dropped considerably. Um, and last year and the year before, we lost 12 rhinos this year so far, about seven. So we're never going to say we're going to stop poaching totally. I think that will be a, a very brash um, claim to make um, that one can do that. But obviously the aim is to reduce the rate of poaching to a level that's below the rate of natural population increase and overall of a net increase. If we can achieve that, we're doing well. And, and let's face it, uh, the, the low foot rhino populations have essentially saved themselves in the sense that um, although poaching has been heavy, the natural reproductive growth rate has been 10% and more allowing those populations to suffer pretty serious poaching attrition, but still hang in there and build. And that comes down to factors I'll be discussing later to do with the importance of maintaining large viable populations and not having your rhinos and dribs and drabs that suffer from small population effects, including the um, serious impacts of poaching in small populations. 
Okay, so why, why another reason why the approach has gone, approaching has gone down, we can't always pat ourselves on the back and claim credit. Um, there's absolutely no question that um, these poaching gangs, they're not local people. There are many myths surrounding the green militarization of poaching, of, of anti-poaching as, as it's put. Uh, uh, stories that uh, once turning your local community is against you by engaging in strong anti-poaching. And while obviously there's a huge need to entrain local communities. <laughs> Not sure what's happening here. Um, anyway, um, while it's obviously very important to keep local communities on side and, and and do that by being good neighbors to them as much as possible and help where you can, just like neighbors do, the, the bottom line here in Zimbabwe is that our poaching is perpetrated by gangs equivalent to bank robbers. They're very mobile. They cover the whole country. They're involved in other forms of crime, including uh, ivory poaching. The same poachers we've seen pop up regularly as ringleaders and as as foot soldiers in the in the low felt um on rhino poaching incursions or the same guys who've been linked to for instance the poisoning of elephants in wanky to a large extent the wiping out of, of elephants up in the sabungu area out of gokwi which is a hot spot and more recently we've seen this problem of, of gold smuggling uh gold digging and panning is a very murky activity in zimbabwe uh excuse the pun um but it provides about 15% of the um, employment, uh, informal employment in Zimbabwe. It's conducted under very unclear, murky regulations, um, which mean that um, a blind eye is turned to a lot of the uh, illegality, unfortunately, um, and that results in estimates of between one and a half and two billion dollars worth of gold smuggled per year out of Zimbabwe. 30 to 35, 30 to 34 tons was an estimate I read in the press last week. And obviously, um, this is very attractive to, to criminal syndicates. Whatever people say about rhino horn being worth its weight in gold, it certainly isn't by a long way. Um, and therefore, um, it's much safer to procure gold, particularly from the artisanal um, gold panners. Um, and um, the cartels will use their smuggling opportunities to smuggle gold out the country, particularly to, to, to Dubai and India in preference to to getting horn out, which is a lot more difficult to acquire and to market. So I think this has been a big factor why approaching is declined. Um, uh, looking at our totals, as I said before, most of them in the low top. The red line there is the, the three populations now are joined by a fourth in Ghana Azure in the low top. Um, I'll discuss that a bit later. The purple line is the total, and the green dotted line is the rest of the country, which you can see is pretty static. And that comes down to some pretty important conservation biology considerations to do with rhino conservation, which I'll get onto later. What is important about Zimbabwe, even though we're the fourth largest range state, in other words, there's three other countries with more rhinos, being uh, South Africa, Namibia, and Kenya, we've got uh, three key one populations in terms of the IUCN criteria. Populations, growing populations of over 100 black rhinos in each. These are just black rhinos I'm talking about here, not, not white rhinos. Um, and you can see South Africa as a whole has only got three. Kruger National Park, Shishuam, Pelosi, and Great Fish. And Namibia's got two. Atosha, which is the world's largest black rhino population of well over a thousand, and the Kuneni Desert rhino population. Um, Kenya's got one or two, um, but we've got three. Um, and that counts for a lot, particularly since uh, two of those populations are sourced from rhinos out of the Zambezi Valley. They were taken at a time when the Zambezi Valley population had not been through a long bottleneck, unlike the South African populations that were residual in uh, Shishuyam, Folozi, and Mkuzi. So the Zambezi uh, population was decimated by poaching within a single rhino generation, basically, and, and didn't go through a prolonged bottleneck in which it lost genetic diversity. So moving those animals in fairly large numbers to Various parts of Zimbabwe, half went to Wanky, half went to private land. And of those that went to private land, um, which was about 150, um, most of them ended up in the low felt. Uh, although they were moved to other areas such as the Midlands, the habitat factors for black rhinos were against them. They didn't fare well there. And we ended up consolidating them as much as possible in the low felt. Despite, I have to say, a lot of opposition, um, a lot of human politics, which interfere with 
rhino conservation work to very I, are we all muted? That was quite an, a noise interference from my side. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I'm muting people as they come and come into the into okay. the chat, Raul. Sorry, I missed that one. Okay, no problem. So by moving these rhinos, while they're still at pretty high genetic diversity from the Zambezi Valley and building up the populations quickly, we minimized the loss of genetic diversity for factors I'll discuss just right now, which means that these low fog populations that came from the Zambezi Valley, which are the Bubi Valley population and the Sawyer Valley population have been proven uh, over the last few years to have the highest genetic diversity of any of the Southern African black rhino population. The rhinos of Mailang, which is the third dot in the southeast corner of Zimbabwe, uh, originated from uh, KwaZulu Natal. They were imported privately through a commercial deal, um, and therefore they're the same as the South African stock. So those two populations are really, really valuable in continental terms, and there's a lot of demand for them to genetically supplements the more genetically the, the corporate South African rhinos. Um, and I think a lot more should be done in that regard. Um, now, small populations are fixed. When we come just as an example of this to white rhinos, we can see the problems. We've got dribs and zabs of white rhinos in Zimbabwe. We've got rhinos at Chivera, Kyle, Matobo, um, and also dribs and drabs on private land, which have been in breeding, haven't had genetic supplementation for years. It's important they stay in some of these areas, even though they are not, from a conservation biology point of view, ideal situations, because they do provide uh, recreational opportunities, educational opportunities, awareness opportunities. For instance, a lot of people love driving out of Ferrari and going to Chivera and seeing a few rhinos. So we should have nothing against that, but they do need to be managed in a meta population. Um, and um, as a consequence of the lack of that management, for instance, we've seen the problems arise last year in August. There was a massive problem in Kyle Recreational Park near Mazvinga. The lake level had risen uh, in the previous rains um, to 97% of the, the lake capacity, which doesn't happen very often. That flooded the shoreline grassland. There's massive bush encroachment um, by alien species such as Lantana and Kyle, which hasn't been dealt with over the years. There's competition from com competing uh, browsers and grazers. There isn't. Um, there isn't a proper fire management plan. Um, there's likely high parasite loads in these rhinos from the fact that you've got rhinos concentrated in a small lakeshore area next to a water body with, with uh, parasite um, hosts in that in the form of snails, et cetera. So we, we had a problem of, of calves dying and we were called in to rescue them. Uh, three died in the period of three weeks before we were called in. Of the four, we moved two died during the translocation. As you can see by these photos, they on the last legs. And this is going to happen again. We desperately need a white rhino meta population plan. And, and as conservation biologists know, when we talk about a meta population, we don't just mean the set of individual populations in the country, which are often referred to as a meta population, like a national meta population. We're talking about populations that are actually managed together through managed gene flow between them, where you've got a clear plan to exchange genetic material you know, through rhinos or if you were able to do artificial reproduction through, through, through that between these different subpopulations. So they're linked to subpopulations. And we don't have that um, for Zimbabwe. Um, now, this moves on to the fact that some runners are not equal to others. Um, as we've seen the poaching decimate the runner populations in the large state and provincial parks in South Africa. That's meant the proportion of, of rhinos on private land in South Africa has increased considerably out of the national total. But a lot of those rhinos are in dribs and drabs. They have five rhinos here, maybe 10 there, three here. They're not managed as a meta population. And there's no way, given the flagship value, which I mentioned before, black rhinos, um, that you could say that, say, one white rhino on a small farm in Orange Free State is equivalent in it's it's biological value to a, a black rhino in a large reserve such as Kruger National Park. So the African rhino specialist group has spent a bit of time looking at how to go about rating or, or scoring rhino populations and individual rhinos in a way that, that that better reflects the underlying conservation biology attributes. And I apologize to any of you who've already been in these discussions on this because it has been a bit of a team effort, um, but I know some of you haven't, so I'll run through it. Um, so this is the rating system that was 
developed and the objective was to provide a, a performance metric for the monitoring and evaluation of rhino conservation. Um, and this is particularly important as we seek new sources of funding for rhino conservation. Safari hunting, which obviously for rhinos has not been a big deal in South Africa, in, in Zimbabwe, but has been in South Africa and Namibia, um, has nonetheless been important in Zimbabwe in that the other animals that have hunted have generated the necessary income for uh, private land areas um, for them to be able to spend on the massive costs of conserving rhinos, which are very little value to them. They can't actually hunt them, as I said. They can't trade them because national parks um, strongly control anything like that. Um, and there's been no trading of white rhinos in Zimbabwe for, for decades. Um, this tourism is suppressed and has been for a long, long time in Zimbabwe. So we're increasingly looking at impact investment, at, at trying to market um, these rhino conservation opportunities as representative of a broader constellation of biodiversity. But we have to be able to show impact metrics. We have to be able to show that impact investment, which is orientated towards achieving um, auditable, independently verifiable um, uh, conservation gains um, is actually, um, you know, is, is something that can be done in a country like Zimbabwe, uh, where the world can get a bang for its buck in terms of, of seeing that tangible uh, conservation improvement. So we need a metric for that. The current IUCN rating system identifies key or important populations. I mentioned before that there are three of these key populations in Zimbabwe, but there's also a variety of other categories of, of, of rhino population that the African rhino specialist group uses. And these, these have been used to guide funding allocation decisions. So we still need to maintain that. But what we need to do increasingly is draw attention to the unproductive populations. The IUCN system has been very geared towards highlighting the, the really important populations, but has not done anything about highlight, highlighting the problems of dribs and drabs around the place and showing what proportion of a national population is in that in that drips and drabs kind of situation, which we're seeing the effects of, as I said, in Zimbabwe. So let's see what IUCN is trying to do. IUCN is trying to conserve large enough populations of, of, of animals in areas large enough to support them in a self-sustaining way, interacting with the full range of everything that impinges upon the evolution of the species. So big wild populations. We know that this genetically is important. I mean, I'll just flash up a few slides here, which are standard conservation biology material. We know that um, as inbreeding builds up in a variety of species, we're talking about small species, yeah, but nonetheless, the principle extends. Um, as the inbreeding builds up, we see uh, survival rates going down. We can see here that um, where you've got Populations in this case, the example was North American bighorn sheep. The larger populations will persist. 100% um, of big bighorn sheep populations with a population size of over 100 survived over a period of 50 years, but other smaller populations just blinked out steadily. And we've seen that all over with rhinos, including uh, in South Africa and Kenya in particular. Part of this is due to the problem of genetic drift and just, you know, I'm talking to people who, um, I don't want to sound like I'm teaching them basic biology here, but 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 maybe there's some who who are interested in, uh, in some of the basics. <laughs> um, you know, we're looking at, at the genetic um, constitution of a population. It's a bit like a bowl of this alphabet soup where you, your noodles are, are like um, the layers of the alphabet in your soup. And each reproductive event, event is like scooping a, a, a scoop of that soup from one bowl to another. So it, as you scoop into the alphabet soup, you'll randomly pick up some of the letters of the alphabet. And the more you scoop, the more likely you are to pick up the full range of letters of the alphabet and, and get the full genetic representation of the, of, the, of the parent population into the F1 and then into the F2 generation. The less reproduction you have, that means the less random sampling from one generation to the next. That means the loss of genetic variability, which is um, which is part of this genetic drift problem. So key factors in looking at uh, conservation biology of, of large animals. Um, these obviously are very thumbsight broad 
brush ballpark, uh, vague, unclear, remaining to be defined for, for, for specific species. But something like 500 rhinos uh, population uh, is going to be required for long-term genetic viability. And those are animals that are interacting with each other or manage together in some way through a metapopulation. Um, as I mentioned before, the metapopulation management approach is not straightforward or common in rhino conservation. And it's not that easy, as I'll mention, as I'll discuss later, because you can't just pick up a rhino from one part of the landscape and move it off to another part of the landscape without lots of consequences and, and implications. Um, the population growth rate, as I just mentioned, the faster the growth rate, um, the more reproductive events from one generation into the next, the the, the less the loss of diversity. Population expansion potential is obviously critical because you get the density dependent feedbacks on, um, on population growth. Um, or there needs to be a regular destocking program, and I won't get into it now, but um, the model that's strongly recommended for rhinos is what's called set percentage destocking, um, with uh, Peter Goodman in particular and Quasi Natale has shown how taking off a set percentage, say 5% of your population every year means that your, your population growth eventually stabilizes at 5%. Your, your, your population growth matches the destocking. Like I said, I won't get into that right now, but that is obviously a very important thing. And in South Africa, they've been trying to implement this through the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project. But unlike us in Zimbabwe, they suffer from a lack of space to put rhinos into. Um, we've got plenty of space. We don't have the security. South Africa doesn't have the space, and they don't have the security. So to some extent, we're a bit better off in that regard. Then the founder population, a long ago, when I first started working in the uh, IUCN, uh, what was then the Combined Elephant Rhino Specialist Group, this rule of thumb of having 20 unrelated founders to establish a new rhino population came out, but it's desperately in need of review based on um, a, a better understanding of the ratio between um, effective population size, in other words, the effective breeders in your population and the total population size. But that's currently the rule um, or the guideline. Um, then obviously, if you've got unnatural manipulation of rhino breeding, if you deliberately are uh, re restricting access um, of some bulls to, to cows, etc., then you're not allowing natural selection. So looking at, at the allocation, of conservation resources and attributing outcomes to that. Really, it's very complicated. It's not just a matter of one, one input going in, like one donor's grant funding to an area. If you look at what's needed for effective rhino conservation, there are a few major factors. You obviously need a, some sort of generally conducive policy at a national level that allows you to build up your rhinos, allows you to deal with poaching in, in, in some reasonable way. Um, you need a, a, a viable rhino population um, meeting some of the requirements that I'm outlining here, you need money um, and you need effective management. And effective management and money often tie together in that the effective managers tend to attract the funding uh, in a kind of a snowball effect. And we've seen that happening, particularly with some of the co-management projects in Africa, very successful projects like the Ghana Resort One and the North Orango Conservation Project or Frank Wood Zoological Society, examples of these co-management problems that are projects that are well managed and attract money in a snowball way, Africa Park similarly. But it's very hard then to separate it out and say what actual specific inputs have, have contributed, what the attribution is um, of a particular type of input or particular donor's funding to what was achieved. Um, and, you know, as I said before, when you're dealing with things like, like management, um, it, it's very hard to quantify that. So the best that may be done is just to take a bit of a black box approach regarding what's happening in each area and track the overall performance of a mix of investments that are made into each black box or several black boxes if you've got them as a, as a set of investments like a portfolio. So to do that, we need some sort of biological scoring system like we track a stock market or GDP index where we can actually um, monitor the performance of that portfolio of investments. And then for a, for a country or portfolio, we can just add up the biological values of the constituent subpopulation. Um, obviously, the most important thing overall is going to be population growth, um, and that requires expansion potential. Um, 
but then we have to consider the genetic diversity and how that affects the conservation biology of different species. Um, if a population uh, is a large population, but still able to keep growing strongly, obviously that population more valuable than a smaller population or even one of the same size that doesn't have any expansion potential. Um, so we can derive a biological value by weighting uh, the rhino or the total population by factors that pertain to the recent population growth rate, net growth rate, expansion potential, and inbreeding risk that's arising. And that gives us a basis for, gives us our performance metric for comparing the different situations. And, and as I said before, uh, we are merely trying to attach a value, just like you'd attach a financial value to assets in a company or something. Uh, not trying to say how that company is actually managed um, um, so that an investor will make his own decisions on whether he wants to invest in a company and change the management if he feels he wants to, but but recognizing that there's a certain value of assets in that company. So we're trying to come up with this biological value. Um, and it might sound as though I'm banging on a little bit about investment and donors, et cetera, but <laughs> we're not going to save rhinos unless we can attract this investment. So if we look at it simplistically and we look at what the economists call a futures value, if we've got 100 rhinos growing at 8% per annum, then we could say simplistically they've got, a, they've got a value of say 108 compared to another population of the same size, but it's only growing at 2% per year, which has got a value of 102. So 108 versus 102. Um, but if one population is going to be overstocked quite soon, or has low genetic diversity, then that must be factored into the score. We obviously need some basic information, and it's remarkable how uh, in Zimbabwe um, we used to struggle just getting basic information for each rhino area. We'd have an annual rhino meeting, and the managers of the different areas would be meant to present their population figures. And what they presented in one year often bore very little relationship to what happened in the last year. Suddenly, you find Montesadona, for instance, has got 30 less rhinos than claimed the year before, but there's no explanation what happened to those rhinos. So we introduced a very simple table that essentially required a tabulation from year to year of what was going on. The population at the start of the year, the births, the translocations in, translocations out, natural mortalities, poaching mortalities, ending up with the final population for the year, which then had to be the start population for the next year. And while this sounds incredibly simple, I can tell you even now on a broader continental basis, these kind of tabulations are not routinely done. And there's a huge variation. Those African on a specialist group um, figures I gave earlier subject to these kind of errors. But this approach has been introduced now in Zimbabwe and it, it is meant to be followed by each rhino area and it does help sort it out. And with this basic information, we can come up with the calculations that we need to follow this scoring system. In fact, we don't even need all this. Um, we don't, for instance, have to know exactly how many births or deaths there were, as long as we know how many rhinos were at the start and the end of a certain period and how many rhinos were translocated in and translocated out. So looking at these, the factors, obviously the primary demographic factor is gonna be the population size and the population growth rate. And the population growth rate will be affected by the poaching rate uh, resulting in a net growth. For translocations in and out, we can take them into account in working out that biologi biological growth rate. And we've got formula that do that, that take into account when certain, a certain number of rhinos were introduced into a population or a certain number was moved out and, and how that then results in a, in a correction to the biological growth rate. Um, so translocations have got their, uh, obviously got their influence, but they can be incorporated in the biological growth rate, but poaching rates are separate issue. Uh, the reliability of data, obviously, if you don't have very reliable data, then uh, your population, uh, your demographic uh, 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 calculations, your parameters are not going to be very accurate. The biological management factors, the carrying capacity, which I mentioned, overstocking in it. Overstocking is a serious problem. There's no question that rhinos are subject to density dependent feedback. Um, and um, as they build up, uh, we get reduced reproduction, we get greater fighting between the rhinos. Generally, the overstocking is shown in social effects, uh, more fighting between the animals, wounding of animals, not necessarily always resulting in mortality. Strange things happening like calves getting abandoned, rhinos shifting their home ranges all sorts of indications of social stress before we see rhinos falling over dead of, star of starvation. Um, the other obviously uh, important component of biological management is what I've said before, metapopulation management, any management of breeding, the founder size, whether it's more or less, 
we met 20 unrelated founders. And then the, the population estimate, as I said. So if your population estimate is plus or minus 5% of the true figure, your population could be, of 100 rhinos, could be as low as 95. If your, uh, if, if it's a plus or minus 20% estimate, a population of 100 could be as low as 80. So you have to wait according to that. And then the expansion potential, if the population can grow beyond the next two years, if there's a firm destocking plan established, those are positive factors. Uh, the poaching rate, if that exceeds biological growth rate, obviously that's a negative factor in many ways, but it, <laughs> it is a pragmatically taking care of your, your overstocking problem. So you have to take that into account. And then the effects of overstocking or with the areas already overstocked. And these weightings are still being worked on. You know, we have to pull together data from different areas and see um, what these actually mean in, in terms of, of demographic uh, impacts um, that we can then base these weightings on as, as precisely as possible. Genetic is even more subject to ongoing discussion. Um, we need weightings for whether the, what the current population size is, what the number of founders in that population size is, the degree of mate choice, et cetera. Ideally, what we should do is actually get genetic um, uh, measurements, interest inbreeding coefficients from each population. That's entirely achievable, but regrettably, as one of the big constraints we face in Zimbabwe and also in other countries at the moment, getting routine genetic analysis of samples is extremely difficult. There are major restrictions on exporting samples, and they're less to do with CITES because there are provisions under CITES for exporting samples through a quick track process for scientific research, such as genetic work. That's not really the problem, although many people pretend it is. The problem is research agendas, uh, empire building, um, and um, misplaced notions that uh, under the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, countries could suffer from uh, genetic piracy by people somehow or another stealing genetic um, material from, from them uh, if samples are exported. So there's all kinds of impediments that really need to be overcome. If, if they could be overcome and we could get these genetic parameters looked at in a straightforward way, um, through a standardized approach of different labs, looking at parentage analysis, getting finally the figures of effective breeders versus um, the general population inbreeding coefficients, we could build these factors straight into this um, population scoring approach. And maybe we'll get there eventually, um, although it's a frustrating process. So the biological value can take all these factors into account, and we can see one population of, 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 of say, 100 rhinos taking these factors and weight weightings into account could be rated as having a value of 105, which is more than the actual number, whereas another population of 100 rhinos with some negative factors in place could be given a weighting of only 73. But at least you've got some weightings now. You can add these weightings up for different populations to get the total value of a, pop of a portfolio. We can adjust for the relative rarity of the rhino species. There are about two times as many rhino, uh, white rhinos as black, so we can bring that into account and, and, and downweight the the white rhino values accordingly, then add up the total rhino values and come up with your total portfolio value. Um, the, it's not just a rarity value with the black rhinos, but as I mentioned before, the fact that they do have greater flagship value. Um, white rhinos can be farmed fairly easily, as we've seen through uh, very commendable efforts in South Africa, to be honest. I mean, whatever one might say about the objectives for the rhino farming that's happened uh, in some of the big breeding centers in South Africa, one certainly has to take one's hat off to the way in which they have successfully bred white rhinos, you know, in one population to well over a thousand in a fairly small area, whereas the zoos have failed pretty dismally at that um, through, um, through their obsession with intensive management rather than letting their rhinos have the space and, 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 and association with other rhinos to behave more naturally. Um, we could, of course, I mean, there's different uh, ecologically significant units of rhinos that identified. There's four for black rhinos at the moment, and there's white rhinos. Uh, the northern white rhinos, you can pretty well unfortunately wipe, wipe out, but the southern white rhinos and the four black rhinos, we could within each of those evolutionally significant units come up with measures of genetic diversity, et cetera, um, and develop genetic weighting there. So there's still quite a lot to be done here. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can add up the biological values for the different populations. So I've tried to get into this into a little bit of detail just to highlight some of the basic conservation biology issues to do with, with rhinos. 
Um, and, and also why it is that it, given that we're trying to achieve line of performance, we need these metrics to be able to direct that um, the necessary resources. We've got a biological value. We can track it like a stock market index and see how we're doing. Um, and moving on to how the money comes from. I mean, there are innovative approaches in investing in, 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 conserva in uh, conservation for a range of species and all the different uh, professional groups that are involved in species conservation are paying their attention um, to different models for, for investing in, in the survival of these animals. Uh, in the rhino field, we've had this um, uh, rhino, in, rhino bond, which has been developed. Uh, it, it's it's changed a lot from what it was when I was first involved in the discussions on that. Um, and I think it's actually gone into a far too complicated and not necessarily generally applicable way. Um, but it has generated a lot of money from the World Bank. And there's two rhino populations in South Africa that are going to be supported through this rhino bond, which is interesting. Um, and I've, I've putting a few slides in here to explain impact investment, impact bonds, um, and why they're so important for animals like rhinos. Impact bonds are not traditional bonds with trust funds investments where the return is not return based upon these, these these performance metrics related to conservation returns or they could be related to community or other social returns that are achieved through the money. But essentially the investors risk their profits and 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 and, and put their capital then to achieve positive outcomes. Um, for which they then repay their investment. Um, so if we look at what's needed for rhino protection, we need a lot of money. Uh, it needs to be sustained. Three-year projects and utter waste of time, most generally. You need 10, 20-year projects. Our Lerford Rhino Conservancy project has been running for over 30 years. Um, and you need a lot of potential for adaptability. And I have to be critical of a number of international NGOs um, who have, who really um, have got very fixed templates for allocating their funding. Uh, they require field managers to jump through all those kind of hoops and hurdles in terms of coming up with log frames and theories of change and reporting procedures and so on, which are then sent to people sitting at desks who haven't got a clue really how the things work in the field and are very reluctant to allow adaptive management as circumstances in the field change. Um, and when we had that money from the bar trust that that MX mentioned earlier, we never would have managed to have got those low for conservancies going if that was traditional funding from traditional donors. The bar trust was an organization that did allow this flexibility. So there's no doubt in my mind that we need flexible funding and this impact bond approach is, is recognizes that and tries to move that way. It's long term provides incentives and essentially that um, the the impact investors don't get paid their money back if they don't actually achieve the benchmark for success that was established for that bond. So looking at it simply here, um, investors put their money into um, a managed fund, call it a portfolio. The money gets down via the site managers to the rhino effort on the ground over a period of time. Uh, a desired outcome is set, such as that over a period of, say, five years, there will be a an average annual growth rate maintained of at least 5% per year of the rhino population. If that benchmark is achieved, then after five years, the investors get paid back their money, plus they get a, an, an interest factor or bonus factor. Um, and obviously you need outcomes funders for that. You need somebody who's gonna pay back the initial investors. And that will be your, um, your World Bank's, uh, GEF's, um, governments or countries. Um, and bearing in mind here that a big thing about these bonds and there's many impact bonds that relate to social things, uh, social factors, is that governments only pay for success. The taxpayer's money is only allocated to successful outcomes. So it's a lot more efficient than, than throwing money at, at, at situations where, you, where you're not actually paying simply for success. So these things all need the performance metric, which is why I've been working on this. Um, and if you don't meet the performance metric, the outcomes fund is not gonna pay back the investor. Um, so, I've tried to make a link there between fundamental uh, rhino conservation bio biology attributes building towards a performance metric, which in turn uh, helps us to mobilize funding in a, in a, in a logical way. But within all this, <coughs> we have to consider the rhinos themselves and how they get managed. And while I, I haven't got the time to deal with all the different aspects that I 
find very fascinating about rhinos in terms of their biology and social interactions, etc. I'd just like to mention something here, which comes back to my point that it's not so easy to move rhinos around from one part of the landscape to another. Um, you'll often see people coming up with um, with models that, that essentially imply exactly that. You move two rhinos from here and you put them there, and then after a period of time, you're going to move some rhinos from here to there. But it hasn't been so easy, really. Um, and there's no question now that a more tra tranquil reintroduction scenario with less dispersion, less fighting, is achieved if you, if you restock rhinos that are already bonded within a social group. Obviously, you have to consider that rhinos that are within a social group might be to some extent related to each other. So therefore, that benchmark of 20 unrelated founders for establishing a new rhino population might not be adequate. You have, may have to be, move more rhinos in order to have um, an adequate genetic diversity in your founders as well as the social bonding between them. Sorry, I'm not going too far there. So Natasha and Anderson, who works for the Low Pod Rhino Trust, has spent a lot of time looking at these individual rhinos. Every rhino in our uh, monitoring program is individually monitored. Every rhino has got a name, an ID number, and a lot of history behind it that, that, that we record. Um, a lot of people say this individual monitoring is not feasible for large populations. I completely disagree. With black rhinos, they live in very established home ranges in very uh, structured uh, social groups. Um, they're not migrating across huge landscapes. So um, there's no reason why the situation is different for, say, 200 black rhinos compared to 400 rhinos, other than that you need twice as many monitoring staff, but you can still monitor them on an individual basis just by scaling up the effort. So monitoring these rhinos on an individual basis in source areas, and this comes back to the rhinos that were moved during the uh, the absolute anarchy of the land reform program where areas were getting invaded that were not meant for resettlement because it was viable, the low field semi arid areas, um, but they were settled and that meant the rhinos in there had to be moved out, which we were only able to do in dribs and drabs because we didn't have enough money and we often didn't have enough political uh, support uh, uh, approval to move these rhinos all in a single year. So we moved them in dribs and drabs. So we had, a, for instance, a, a group of rhinos in Bobiana Conservancy, which right now, after having had 90, over, well, over 100 rhinos uh, uh, at its height, now has got zero as a combination of poaching and the translocation of output. While it had rhinos, we were monitoring them, and Natasha was able to record that we had these rhinos, a set of uh, animal black rhinos living in this kind of orientation as shown on the left in the, in the, in the green uh, in Bobiana. These animals were moved often in drips and drabs to Booby Valley, much bigger area released there, sometimes in different parts of the of Booby Valley, and they reassociated in, in exactly the same um, orientation as they had back in Bubiana. They found each other, sometimes amongst many other rhinos, some of whom had come from other areas, um, but they found each other and, and sorted themselves out. So rhinos have got incredible uh, locational um, abilities in relation not just to geographical features but also in terms of of, of their neighbors uh, their rhino neighbors and these have to be taken into account if you translocate rhinos for instance as was done to north Rwanda in zambia those rhinos that knew each other before translocation survived um, at a far greater rate than the animals that were just chucked together from different areas the survival outcome was much much better for those animals um, if we look at this Bobiana to Bubi Valley translocation, and we look at how far apart a bunch of the rhinos in, in Bobiana lived uh, from each other compared to where they lived each, to each other when they were moved, you can see that the rhinos were neighbor, that were neighbors in Bobiana remain neighbors in, 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 uh, in Bubi Valley, whereas animals that had not been close to each other in the one area tended to drift away um, in, in the new area. So these are the kind of insights that come from long-term monitoring, which we're really looking forward to writing up. Um, we brought this um, experience to bear in planning the restocking to Bonner Resort National Park. It's very important to do a very objective professional feasibility study, obviously before moving rhinos into any area. Um, the, the ecology, the habitat factors, the security all need very detailed review. Um, there have been some rather catastrophic rhino translocations, and Emex mentioned one that happened in Kenya and to Savo East, which was a 
100% disaster. All the animals died. There have been others, such as the move of rhinos to Zakum and Chad, which have resulted in most of the rhinos dying. So, given the value of these animals, we need to do it properly. The other problem is that wrapped up with rhino conservation are a lot of human egos um, and conservation, uh, sorry, uh, commercial motives in moving rhinos around. Here in Zimbabwe, we've been seeing a lot of pressure to move rhinos from the Lofot, where we have the large populations, to other parts of the country, but often without proper consideration of the fundamental factors that will allow their long-term survival. So for Ghana as well, we try to make sure that a benchmark was set in doing a really detailed professional feasibility study that was reviewed by the IUC and African Rhino Specialist Group. And that included looking at where uh, a small fence, uh, 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 an IPZ with a small, a low fence could be constructed either north of the Rundi River with a small section south or entirely south of the Rundi River taking security factors into account, and then also considering this question of what the social linkages were with the rhinos that would be moved there. So 15 rhinos were moved from, from Bibi Valley, four from Sai Valley. It was meant to be five, but unfortunately they could only find four of those on the list. And they were listed uh, for these factors of social linkage, sex, age, whether we knew they were related or not. And the reason, and, and they were also, sorry, that 10 moved from Mailangui. Uh, into Ghana as well. So instead of 20 founders, 30 were moved to try and account for the fact that it could be a degree, well, there was a degree of relatedness among some of these. There were some cow calf pairs as well. Um, and there wasn't any mortality in that translocation. So um, I think it's very gratifying, and I'll end on this note, um, to have been involved in bringing to bear some of these um, long term rhino management insights into a successful restocking program. I moved the last rhino out of Ghana Azul um, in the previous phase of, 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 of Ghana Azul's rhino history in 1992. So it was a real pleasure, what, 30 years later to be involved in bringing them back again. And in particular, having a successful reintroduction that I'm sure will continue to be a success based on really understanding all these um, fairly, well, fairly complex interactions among rhinos that tend to be ignored by the people who just think rhinos are solitary, aggressive, stupid animals that just fight each other all the time. It's much, much more complicated. So I hope I've skimmed over <laughs> adequately um, a huge subject enough to prompt some questions. And uh, maybe I should leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thanks, Raoul. Um, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at a first question, but in the meantime, can I ask people to either raise their hands or to put their questions into the chat so that we can, we can have a discussion about the very many, very interesting things in, in Raoul's talk. Um, Raoul, the first question is from me is, what is the timeline on that type of feasibility for Gonorrhageau, quite apart from the time it took to get the land secure enough? um to to reintroduce rhinos sure yeah i mean just dealing with your second point first getting the land secure yeah. that took a hell of a long time and because yeah. land secure also involved sorting out the financial and administrative arrangements for the co-management of guan mm -hmm. obviously putting money in as frankfurt and other donors were into guan wanted to be sure that there was appropriate management there that the management problems that have arisen in that park before wouldn't simply re-arise. So it took a long time for the co-management between Frankfurt Zoological Society and National Parks to be thrashed out and formalized in the formation of the Bonnerville Conservation Trust. So that that took years. Um, I mean, I'm talking about 10, 15 years to, uh, to yeah. get to this, having it formalized. The actual planning for the reintroduction, um, uh, I mean, these don't take that long because there's a lot of information. I mean, we mustn't forget that these rhino areas, particularly those that have had rhinos in them before, often have got a, a, a treasure trove of past reports, even if they're unpublished on national parks records and so on. Um, yeah. Bonner has had research staff who did a very competent job in, in not just the, um, the, high, the high period of rhino numbers in, in the park, but also during the period of poaching and keeping track of what was going on, where the rhinos lived and so on. So, it's very important to be able to dig out that information and review it um, yeah. rather than just coming in blindly. Uh, so that obviously takes a period of time is finding all that historical information. But I'd say you 
you know, if you're looking at a study for gonorrhea in terms of, of, of solid man days spent on it, you could get a study done in 15 or 20 man days of solid professional effort, as long as yeah. you were doing it, got a good understanding of where to get the data. And then you right. also have to some extent consider seasonal factors. So unless you do have a lot of background information on a particular park, um, if you're just looking at it, eyeballing it pretty well from scratch and don't have much idea about it, particularly if it's in a habitat that hasn't had rhinos in for a long period of time, yeah. you, you'll to go through a period of seasonal evaluation through the full full annual you know cycle to to really understand when the nutritional crunch periods might come. Okay, thank you. Um, a related question is. You know, you talked about um, South Africa having neither security nor space, Zimbabwe having space, but not necessarily security. Um, I mean, in the long term view for black rhinos, how much real capacity for growth is there in terms of safe, secure space? Whether that's well, um, in Zimbabwe or, or um, across the continent. Sure. I mean, it's also hard to define secure space. I mean, I use yeah. that word very because I'm sure you did as well, because um, it's very context specific. You know, the, the, the particular pressures that arise in one area may be very different to those in, in another, um, yeah. or the security context may be very different. Um, you know, I really sympathize with Kruger National Park where they've got wall to wall settlement um, yeah. right boundaries. I mean, it's just incredible when you look at the millions of people around Kruger. Uh, and, and see the challenges that, that they've got, where it's very difficult to have any kind of neighbor impact um, with so many people from, from a conservation agency. But so it, it does vary a lot. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I also said before that we're never going to make any area totally safe. So there's a bit of a risk factor. We can have some high gain, high risk projects where we put runners in areas that have got a degree of, of risk to them in terms of, of poaching pressure. But at the same time, they've got the space and the habitat to allow rapid growth. So you can, it's like a bank investment. You can have, yeah. again, high risk compared to putting your rhinos in a bank vault, which is a more secure area where they're going to be safe, maybe, but they're not going to have much growth. Um, so it, it, it's all a balance. Um, but overall, it boils down to money, how much money um, and policies as well you can used to create uh, conducive conditions. You know, we could expand around us considerably in the low park. We could quadruple the population or, or even more quite easily if we had um, management and money uh, on, the lands, on, on the land that's available, that hasn't been settled, yeah. that's, that's feasible for rhinos. So that is not the same way at all. Um, they've got very little space for expansion of their populations and hence they're moving rhinos to other areas, they move to Mozambique, to Malawi, even to uh, Rwanda, except those were rhinos from the East African um, group. But they are definitely yeah. looking at banning outside South Africa. Obviously, we don't yeah. have to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just to say that Natasha's also contributed that they were able to select the animals going into Gonorrhea because of the huge um, number of years of monitoring in the source areas. So, you know. I think I think that's important. Um, so maybe in Zimbabwe it will continue to be something quite manageable, but maybe in other places where they don't necessarily have that um, detailed level of monitoring, it might be more more challenging. Um, right. Question from Tim. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Diane, and thanks, Raul, for that that talk. I was particularly. I'm interested in um, all the, the thought that's gone into that index for biological value for rhinos. And it looks like there's been a lot of thinking behind that. So it's cool to, to see that going forwards. I was just wondering, um, I imagine you did have to engage with like the other conservation prioritization literature, which also considers threat. So it considers the fact that some populations may be uh, more vulnerable to threat. Um, than others and so a smaller population size with a with a lower growth rate um, might not be prioritized on the the scheme that um, your team's developing but um, if it's under threat and if um, there's concept if there's kind of the first thing being threat and the second thing being um, the 
lack of current conservation intervention. So these bigger populations um, might have more present investment in conservation. I was just wondering how you how you you deal with that contrast between investing where there's lots of rhinos versus where there's not so many but potential for growth. I don't know if that made sense. Sure. The, the problem is that um, yeah, I come back to this problem of um, threat and risk and investing rhinos and so on. Um, it's it's very hard to quantify risk. Um, it, it varies from place to place and from time to time. Usually, I mean, for instance, I mentioned that we've had a, a major reduction in poaching pressure in Zimbabwe, but it's due to factors that have nothing to do with conservation effort. In my view, it's got a lot to do with um, with this gold uh, uh, smuggling, absorbing the the attention of of our crooks. Um, to some extent, COVID may have had some effect as well. So, assessing risk is really really difficult, and that's why we've tried in our scoring system to focus just on biological value and allow different assessments. Just an investor, financial investor, would make his assessments of a company that might be failing, but shows the ingredients for a turnaround. And, and if that investor's got a strategy in his head for how he's going to turn it around, he may well want to invest it. And we may well want to invest rather in a situation where we think we can turn it around with the, with the right factor. So we haven't tried to go that far. One of the things we do need to do, though, in terms of, of understanding um, and, and not trying to reinvent the wheel uh, and trying to get in sync with other efforts at uh, looking at the, um, you know, the, the sort of biological index for, for populations, et cetera, is to look at the IUCN green listing approach, which we did at an early stage. And, and that stage, quite honestly, I wasn't that impressed by it. It was very much based on long, long-term predictions of where your population would be with or without conservation interventions. But things change so quickly for rhinos or any other animals. Um, and how you define um, you know, what a conservation intervention is is quite difficult. But but more recently, I think the IUCN green listing has moved into much more objective approaches that we need we certainly need to look at. And uh, the whole idea is to move populations out of one category into the green onto the green list and yeah there's a lot of work to do on this thank you thank, thanks Raul um so there's a question earlier from Laura um asking your opinion about um dehorning and the introduction of legal horns i.e from from the dehorning practice into the markets um so this is very much a question about, you know, how, how you control su the supply and demand um, chain. Okay, well, this illustrates why we're never giving a talk on rhinos. One needs to understand that there's a lot of stuff's going to come up in the questions. Um, and yep. one of the, these are the questions that do typically come up. Dehorning, uh, just in a nutshell, we've done a lot of dehorning in Zimbabwe. We have pulled together information. I know Tim was mentioning that there's a study being done in the Greater Kruger. When I was in Kruger National Park earlier this year, I was rather horrified to hear a lot of talk that essentially was just reinventing the wheel. There's plenty of experience of dehorning in Zimbabwe and Namibia. Um, and uh, when people were saying dehorning has never been studied on a large scale before, it's absolute nonsense. So dehorning, we found, we, we have done the analysis looking at um, the various mortality factors or survival factors that, that impinge upon rhinos that are either horned or left horned or dehorned. Obviously, dehorning rhinos, there's going to be some slight risk in the veterinary intervention, the actual darting procedure. Uh, there was alleged to be an abortion risk, although we've never seen that. Alleged to be a greater risk of rhinos that have not been, uh, that don't have their horns of losing their calves to predators or losing out in fights with other bulls. Um, and then obviously for the, the rhinos with horns, there might be a greater risk of being pushed. So we put together all those factors for a, a, quite a large sample of, of rhinos in both category in the low felt, exposed to similar poaching pressures. And um, there was no question that the rhinos that had been dehorned had a greater survival rate than the ones that had not. Um, we've never seen social problems with dehorning, and we've done only black rhinos, not so much white, because most of our rhinos are black. Um, and a lot of this comes back to the fact that you have these strong, strong social structures. If a rhino is the dominant bull in the area, 
cutting his horn off is not something that he's going to particularly notice or another rhino is going to particularly notice. They're not always fighting each other. They're interacting in far more subtle ways along boundaries, et cetera. Um, and um, we haven't actually seen that, that mortality factor that allegedly arises uh, between horned and undehorned rhinos is a thing. When it comes to predators, I mean, the biggest predator risk to rhinos comes, black rhinos comes when the cows leave their calves to go to water. Often at night, they leave their small calves hidden. And if they, it's, therefore, it's a material. If a, if a predator finds that, that calf um, and the cow's not there, it doesn't matter whether the cow's got a horn or not. Um, and incidentally, I should just mention that despite the very positive um, comments I made before about the fact that the translocation into Gonorrhea went without any mortality, we have had the loss of, of, of calves, two calves um, in Gonorrhea, one of whom we think was lost through this very uh, reason is that a, a cow unfamiliar with the terrain left her small calf that was born in Ghana as well, obviously conceived in, uh, in the source area. She didn't know the terrain very well. She took too long to get back. And in the meanwhile, the calf was, was gobbled by a predator. So again, comes back to the fact that moving rhinos around not so easy. They, they, uh, they, they need to, to know their neighborhoods. Um, but uh, and then in the other point with dehorning cows is that even if a cow hasn't got a horn, if she's going to um, swing her head with a horn stub at a hyena or a lion, she's still going to cause some pretty serious damage to that animal. I mean, I've been hit by a dehorned rhino before, and I can assure it's like being hit by a bus. So I don't think those factors really count. So no, dehorning is it's a question of cost and management effort. You can't dehorn all your rhinos all the time. We dehorn strategically. Rhinos that are vulnerable, that are near fences or roads, where they're seen by people that have particularly big horns, we will dehorn them. But we don't set out to dehorn all the rhino all the time because it becomes, um, it just becomes a huge management obligation. In South Africa, for interest, there's a lot of dehorning happening in private land, and it's become clear that some of that actually has got, um, you know, it's got an advantage in terms of income generation, and that clients are paying towards the dehorning costs to come along and attend those dehorning events at a rate that's higher than the actual cost of doing the operation. So there is something of a profit motive in this, particularly in the private land areas. And this is the kind of thing where uh, donor NGOs have to be very careful and not simply subsidizing what has become a commercial activity. And also uh, dehorning will shift the poaching pressure elsewhere. So if you've got a bunch of rhinos dehorned in one part of the landscape, the poaching will simply move to another part of the landscape where the rhinos still have their horns. So what are you achieving overall? You have to think about those factors fairly carefully. Um, so dehorning is a complicated issue, but there's lots of experience in it. And certainly from a direct rhino to rhino interaction point of view or rhino to predator point of view, uh, we haven't seen deleterious effects. Um, regarding porn and the market legal trade, that's, I mean, that's a massive area. But I would just suggest that one of the simple calculations to maybe do is to consider how much horn can be supplied sustainably out of Africa. I, I must admit, I'm not familiar with the latest figures on that, but let's say it's 15 tons a year from stockpiles, from uh, salvaging horns from natural mortalities, from dehorning, 15, 20 tons, I don't know, something like that at the most. Then you consider how many billion people there are in China and you divide that amount of horn into every person in China they're going to get something like 0 0.00000 gram of a horn per person. That's obviously a pretty facile argument or, or, or analysis, but it just goes to show the potential demand is massive. And recent work that's been done actually in Vietnam rather than China has shown that um, several factors. One is that uh, the consumers prefer what they call wild horn to farmed horn. Um, and that's something they show with other animal products. They think that the wild grown horn is more efficacious, more concentrated than the farm-grown horn. They, they do show, contrary to many of the assumptions that have been made about rhino horn, they do show elasticity of demand. In other words, if the, if the price of the horn goes up, some of the buyers will drop out. They won't just keep on paying you know, whatever it takes to get the horn. There, there is a limit to what they want, what they're prepared to pay for horn. And they've also shown quite conclusively that mixing up a source, a source of legal horn with a source of illegal horn will simply confuse people regarding the moral issues to do with consuming horn. Um, so 
there are a number of factors. We don't understand the markets, the, 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 the potential of huge demand, the potential for exciting that demand, the confusion that would be created in terms of law enforcement by mixing up some supply of legal horn with illegal horn, you know, all outweigh you know, in international eyes and in my personal eyes, the advantage of any legal trade in horn. Uh, you've got to consider then who will benefit from a legal trade. It'll come to the rhino farmers. It'll come to the people who've got animals that are easily you know, harvested for their horn, essentially the farmed rhinos, the private land rhinos. It's not going to be necessarily benefit um, wild rhinos living in places like Guanajuato unless you want to get onto um, a massive cycle of dehorning with all the impacts that that would result in. And um, makes you wonder, you know, what a national park is all about if what you're doing essentially is farming the rhinos in that area. So, so no, I don't, I don't support illegal trade. Um, and there are many more detailed arguments that that could be made um, on, on, on the issue. Thanks. Thanks, Raoul. I'm going to hand over to MX. He has a question about um, the role of sort of rural communities. MX, do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Raoul. Um, very, very um, uh, interesting talk. Um, just wanted to, to ask, how do we widen the local community stake um, for rhino conservation. Um, it's mostly within conserv conservancies, at least in Zimbabwe and protected areas, category four, um, and, and increasingly, you know, perhaps in Kenya, we, there are efforts around that. But I just wanted to get your thinking around how we widen the state sure. for local communities um, and in that way, hopefully get more support for rhino conservation at the local level who can again be you know stewards of the populations that we have sure okay well i think there are three man approaches and um diane has helped us a lot on these in the past um and we're still plugging on to them in fact we're expanding them a bit the one is obviously any area wildlife area managed for for conservation needs to adopt a good neighbor approach towards its neighbors just like any neighbors um, helping across the fence wherever possible, showing respect for the community leaders on the other side of the fence, attending meetings, dealing with neighbor frictions and opportunities um, in, in, a, in a way that, that, that makes the, the, the overall rhino production community function, including the people around the, around the wildlife area. Like I said before, that's a lot easier done in some areas than others. In Namibia, for instance, have got well-advanced community programs, but then you have to consider that they don't have the land use competition. You're dealing with very arid areas where people are not going to be growing crops, unlike in Zimbabwe, where crop production, even though it fails in many years, is still competitive against you know, the wildlife option for communities in, in many areas. You're dealing in Namibia with um, communities that have got strong traditional structures, um, whereas in Zimbabwe, particularly as a consequence of land reform, we've got very mixed up heterogeneous communities that often uh, have got complicated situations in terms of the traditional leadership structures that you should work with. So it varies a lot from place to place, but being good neighbors is, 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 is pretty, um, pretty generally an obvious thing to do to the extent you can. Then there's the impact investment I mentioned, this, this, uh, this whole question of of putting money into areas based on a performance metric for rhinos, that can be translated into creating a spin-off for the local communities. For instance, in our areas, uh, in the schools around um, Booby Valley, we, we put in annual support to those schools for educational materials, which is more than they get from any other source. And that in turn is actually an input to the community as a whole, because obviously education is a huge um, family um, requirement um, that they have to spend money on. And we make that proportional to the growth of the rhinos in the conservancy. So we provide a benchmark level of support then for every percent of growth in the, in the population in the, in, in the previous year, they get an additional amount as a bonus on top of the baseline amount. And we spend a lot of time explaining that all to them and showing that the world wants rhinos, the world's putting some money into protecting rhinos in Booby Valley, and there can be a spillover benefit based on the rhino production to the local community. So it's all part of that production community. And then um, getting, you can also further find ways to integrate the households into 
not specifically a rhino economy as such, but certainly the wildlife economy, by finding whatever way you can to allow them at a household level to find um, ways of, of marketing their labor, marketing handicrafts, doing whatever they can do through markets and opportunities that you create for them. You know, a small example that we're working on now is getting women's sewing clubs to produce rhino themed handicrafts in the form of linen products with embroidered um, uh, images on them that, that tell a rhino story. Um, and these are quite um, <laughs> varied, sometimes rather quaint images of rhinos. A lot of these people actually don't know much about what a rhino looks like, but they have to find out. And our community coordinator spends a lot of time going around and giving them rhino awareness materials and so on. But it's essentially making the rhinos relevant in, in a rhino economy to these people, even if it's in a small, fairly small way, even if it only brings in a few dollars per household per year or even you know, or per month. It's, it's, it's something that helps to tip the balance between the community, which is essentially inclined to be law-abiding, helping the poachers or at least being neutral towards the poachers and rather helping you and, and, and finding ways to try and deal with these poachers, particularly given that they are not locally based. They are roving gangs who often cause trouble in those communities. And um, just like you know, a, a community would want to deal with bank robbers and amits, we must get them to, to see this as a community and law enforcement effort and provides even small incentives for that and, and, and generate understanding and goodwill. So it's a huge area, and I've, I've just touched on a few things. I'm not an expert on this. Diane, for instance, who I work with IUC, is, is much better able to answer these questions because there's nothing specific about rhinos that isn't general to other wildlife conservation efforts as well. Thanks, Raoul. Um, there's just one last question, and then we'll close. Um, and it's related to what you've just been talking about, which is what are some of the other ways to include rhinos in the wildlife sort of economy, which is becoming a very buzzword nowadays. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, having tourists come on management ops, uh, but are there any other sort of emerging, um, you know, emerging ways that we can start to think about rhinos in the wildlife economy? And that question came from Nobasutu, who specifically said, thank you for shedding light on the rhino bonds, which We've all been trying to follow, and um, I think I finally get it now that I've seen your your latest your latest talk. Um, but you know, any other innovative ideas that are out there for getting rhinos into kind of the wildlife economy, whatever that means? I think I think they had a whole week last week in Rwanda talking about this. So, well, I mean, it's not my field of expertise. I have to say, I've been tracking it fairly closely, and I was involved in the Rhino Impact Bond. From in, in, in its early stages quite quite heavily um, but um, it's a complicated and growing field with new ideas coming up all the time I think that some things might be interesting to, to consider I'm not saying they'd be practical but they certainly might be worth investigating to see if they are practical for instance we could take an average black rhino and we could say it doesn't only represent um, a flagship in a flagship way the natural capital in that area but it might also to some extent represent ecosystem services in that area hydrological and carbon sequestration over the typical home range of a typical black rhino. So you could use the rhinos as a proxy indicator for some ecosystem services as well and try to tap into some of, of those payment for ecosystem service stuff. Like I said, I don't know how practical that would be, but it might be worth playing around with that. Um, obviously, rhinos are very important for tourists, and um, it's not just a draw card for, rhino, for tourists, it's also that where there's a dismal story for rhinos, where there's been poaching of them and a negative story that actually deters tourists from coming to the area at all, even if the other species and in, in, uh, charismatic species in the area are doing well. So I, I do think that more should be said or more could be said about special interest trips for rhinos, uh, for tourists to learn about rhinos, which are a lot more interesting than, than the, 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 the typical um, understanding of rhinos um you know people love elephants for being complicated animals with long social behavior and stuff but but rhinos are also very complicated in that regard you know really interesting things like rhinos will visit dead rhinos even bones of rhinos you are years after their friends have died um just like elephants do um so there's special interest around rhinos that you could maybe build for not just dehorning which is obviously a 
a high adrenaline thing where people are running around in vehicles in the bush and chasing helicopters and vets and all that rugged stuff. But but maybe part of exposure to the complications of of, of managing wildlife that has evolved over years socially and biologically um, in, in, in very interesting ways. Um, I'm not sure I've really done justice to the question. I, <laughs> we'd love to find no, ways. No, that's great. That's that's very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Raoul. I'll, I'll hand it back to MX to do the, the closing. Um, and, and just to say, it's it's been great to think about rhinos for an hour and a half. So thank cool. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Diane. And Raoul, thank you so much. As expected, this has been such a fascinating talk. And I can only say thank you to you for sharing that. I know that there could be quite a number of questions that haven't been answered and uh, like to encourage people, if you've got questions, please do send it to us and we will be in touch with Raul and try and uh, provide an answer to some of your questions. But uh, as I expected, you know, um, lots of information within an hour and a half and lots to chew and think about. So once again, thank you, Raul and the team at the Southeast Law Veld Trust. I will just ask for a favor from everybody. If you can, please do put on your camera so that for once we can get a photo of everybody. Uh, good to see you, Johan, uh, Novesutu, Loris, and... Uh, um, yeah, th this is always an important part to just uh, uh, get a picture of everyone in the different places. And uh, if we can get a few more, that would be amazing. And um, we can just take a photo of, of all of you and uh, uh, we'll ask one of my colleagues once you've taken a photo of uh, everybody, then we could let everyone uh, get their cameras uh, off. Um, and uh, my system is glitching, so I have no idea whether I've taken the picture. Or not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one moment. Thank you. I've, I've taken one and just want to say thank you to everybody for uh, turning up. Um, do join us in our next seminar. We will send out another advert for that. And please do sign up, share uh, that. And if you may, please do join up, sign up for um, on our website. Do check our website as well for various information uh, that we do put up there. The projects that we did highlight um, would like to get more people supporting any of those and so please do get in touch with us if you're interested in uh, the horizon scan the um, the database and uh, the various activities that we spoke about earlier on so once again thank you raul and uh, all the best for the work that you're doing we continue to uh, for, we will continue to follow that work um, um, as a good example to build on. And I'm sure the rest of Africa and other places are looking uh, to the example of the Southeast Law Veld and uh, the rhino conservation in Zimbabwe going forward. So it's only left for me to say thank you to all for attending. Have a good evening wherever you are. Uh, good afternoon or good morning and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye.